30,000 feet above Peru, heading north along the Andes. Destination, Bogota. <laughs> Colombia gets a bad press, and with good reason. The country boasts awesome statistics. It has the highest murder rate in the world. Latin America's longest running civil war. A kidnapping industry that turns over nearly 400 million US dollars a year. The leading cause of death for individuals over the age of 10 is violence. On my first visit to Colombia a decade ago, I was made immediately aware of the uniquely Colombian experience of life and death. The head of this narcotic squad told us, when you go through the door, if you hear automatic weapons open fire, stay back. Helpful, if unnecessary advice. Especially unnecessary, we realized, when we got inside. For this was no raid on the profiteers and victors of the so-called cocaine war, but yet another assault on the losers and victims caught in the crossfire of Colombia's battle for wealth and power. Now, ten years later, as I approached Bogota, I wondered what, if anything, had changed. A ver, espérate, espérate, bueno, mira. ¿qué? Esta es de mil, mi hermano. Bueno. La noche cubre ya con su negro crespo de la ciudad, las calles que cruza la gente con pausa de acción. Piense que el, el, la quinta sería tan, tan oscura. Okay. I'd worked with Quill Lawrence before, an American journalist living in Bogota and writing for the highly respected Christian Science Monitor. Luis Enrique el Plebeyo, el hijo del pueblo, el hombre que supo amar. He had a few problems during the elections. There, there was a lot of violence coming up to the elections, more than there was during the actual voting. Uh, it wasn't like... Uh, uh, in 1990, for instance, when there was somebody who was actually gunning down candidates, they lost three presidential candidates in the lead-ups to 1990. But there were a lot of massacres and a lot of political assassinations. And uh, Andres Pastrana, I've heard that one of the main things he's got going for him is that he's never been accused of corruption. That's pretty rare in this country, isn't it? I, I hate to burst your bubble. Uh, he has been accused of corruption, just not narcotics corruption. <laughs> Compared with the past, Andres Pastrana is squeaky clean. His predecessor, Ernesto Samper, was accused of accepting $6 million from the drug cartels. Pastrana has promised change, but any change must be brought about in a climate of overwhelming corruption and violence. This is not a reconstruction. The bullets are real. Some have benefited indirectly from the violence. John Murphy runs a booming business selling bulletproof clothing. We have guerrillas here and they use military ammunition. So we, in the, for example, in the States, the biggest threat is civilian type ammunition. But here we also have military type ammunition, which is harder to stop. Totally bulletproof. Yeah, hold on. Oh. Miguel Caballero, the designer, tries to combine ballistic functionality with the best in fashion for both men and women. For many businessmen in Bogota, the possibility of violence is just part of everyday life. Jose Pinheiro is an emerald dealer. He was shot three times while being robbed. Now, like most Esmeraldistas, he carries a gun. 
como tú sabes, donde hay dinero y maldad, ¿no? Por todo el mundo es igual. Outside the Pinheiro office, in and around the cafes that line the Plaza de Rosario, millions of dollars are changing hands. Emerald deals are being done. Offers made that can't be refused. Today, Jose and his wife Claudia have an offer that they can't refuse. To be invited to this Emerald clearinghouse is a privilege. It means you've made the grade, joined the club. Selected Esmeraldistas wait their turn to meet an international clientele. This Japanese buyer has come to town with a rumored $3 million to spend. Jose and Claudia hope to get their piece of it. Colombia provides 80% of the world's best emeralds. But what we're watching is the legal trade. An estimated two-thirds of Colombia's emeralds are smuggled out illegally, along with cocaine. Gracias, muy amable. Ciao. Yeah, he's waiting for us. Quill was taking me to see Professor Alejandro Reyes, whose field of study touches most aspects of Colombian life. For Professor Reyes is a violentologist. It is an exceptional situation in Colombia, but the emerald zone uh, has its own law, its own justice system, the police system. All of that is under the control of the patrones, of the admirals, and uh, it is a very absurd situation. Bueno, usted lo ha dicho, gente de Rodríguez Gacha. To understand the emerald industry in Colombia, you must first come to terms with this man, Victor Carranza, known as the Emerald Tsar. Para que me afectaran, para que me perjudicaran. The winner of the Emerald War, in which some 5,000 died, Victor Carranza now rules the Emerald Zone with his own private army. They behave mostly as uh, mafias or as uh, groups of uh, loyalty-type people uh, to bosses with lots of armed men and uh, the control of the population. They are a state within the state. But Don Victor Carranza has two major problems. Firstly, he's now in jail, accused of multiple homicide. And secondly, he is reportedly dying of cancer. He still runs his Emerald Empire from jail, but its future is now uncertain. Today, Jose and Claudia have business up country in the mining district of Cusco, the heart of Victor Carranza's empire. It could be a middle class scene anywhere in the world. Mum and Dad say goodbye to the kids and head off on a business trip. But this is no ordinary business. It's an eight hour journey through the mountains north of Bogota. The possibility of guerrilla attack is very real. The region is disputed, held firmly by neither the government nor the guerrillas. Jose has made this journey to the emerald markets in Cusco repeatedly over the past 15 years. He prefers to travel at night. He tells us it is not safe to have lights. Our filming is therefore by infrared. We were nervous about this mad high-speed escapade through rain-swept mud-sliding roads, but I had great faith in Jesus, our driver. This is a black market. It's where Jose Pinheiro buys his stock. All the stones being sold here are theoretically illegal. The emeralds have been stolen. 
They are stolen by the miners who work for Carranza's company, Emerald Co. But the miners are not paid. They are expected to steal, and they are watched to make sure they don't steal too much. In this almost feudal system, such favours are given by the powerful, and loyalty is shown in return. Even Jose speaks respectfully of Don Victor Carranza. We sought permission at administration to film in the mine. While we were there, there was an arrival. Who is just arriving? Quien era quien acabo de llegar? Don Pablo Elías Delgadillo, un accionista. Un accionista de... De Esmeracol. De Esmeracol. A powerful and colourful businessman. He'd arrived to attend a board meeting the following day. Andrew, ¿cómo está? Mauricio. ¿Cómo se llama? Mauricio. 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 With permission to film granted, we were escorted to the mine. These are the impoverished guaqueros. They don't even have the status of unpaid miners. But they are allowed to search through the rubbish thrown out from the mine. It's a custom that has endured for centuries. For this mountain has been mined for emeralds since before the Spanish arrived. Some can spend their entire lives at subsistence level in the hope of striking it rich. And so we entered the mine. The temperature increased. We were heading towards an area that was causing much excitement. A discovery called La Pintada, or painting, a green glow on the mine wall that discloses the presence of emeralds. The heat became oppressive, almost unbearable. The distant sound of detonations, a constant reminder of the possibility of mine collapse. But I am here by choice. I can always go home. The workers here live with this possibility every day and night. We were two minutes now from the Pintada, the green glow, the discovery of wealth. The humidity was so intense, I wondered what might defeat me first, the heat or the claustrophobia. It was the temperature that won, but it was the camera that gave out first. Forget it. Can't, the film, I can't film, guys. The camera is completely fucked up. It was good to be back in the safe hands of Jesus. We were going to the board meeting, Emerald Co., being held in the absence of the chairman, Victor Carranza unavoidably detained. The board members arrive. These are the warlords who fought the Emerald War. Their peace is dependent on Victor Carranza, but Carranza is gone. I don't know what was discussed in their board meeting, but in this business, the bottom line is violence. I was told that there was to be some rationalization of assets, that some of the investors might find themselves with a reduced portfolio. Victor Carranza and uh, a dozen or two dozen of 
lords of war, private lords of war that we have in Colombia, are a good example of the problems that Pastrana is going to face with a peace problem, a peace process. Que santo el amor de la tierra, que trete la ausencia, que deje la ayer. When the board meeting is over, the warlords will feast. They prepare to carve up the meat. In the background are the slums of the Guaqueros. For in Colombia, the poor must be content to search through the scraps thrown out by the powerful. <laughs> 